to our internet uh, guests. Again, we are just so grateful to have you join us each time. And we want to just continue to remind you, if you haven't, go down and subscribe to this cast so that when we come up, you'll be notified. And continue to, to uh, encourage you to share with your friends, your families, your Sunday school classes that we're here so they too can come aboard and, and be blessed by the Word of God here at World Class Sunday School. What's wrong with the people today? Welcome you to World Class Sunday School. What a beautiful time it is that the Lord will allow us to come together again to share in His Word. Let us go in prayer. Lord, again, we are just so grateful to you for your continuing blessings. We give you praise and honor on today. And as we search your Word, we pray that you would reveal to us the things that you would have us to know and to do. We love you, praise you, and magnify you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks and praises always. Amen. We are continuing in our spring quarter, and we're talking about justice and the prophets. And here in Unit 2 that, that we are currently in, uh, the topic of, of Unit 2 is God promises and just a uh, just kingdom. God promises a just kingdom. And today, the title of our lesson is uh, A Justice Loving God. And we're going to be coming from the book of Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah is writing our lesson today. And we're going to look into Isaiah 61. Uh, 61 chapter 61, verses 8 through 11. Is going to be our, our first outline, and that's entitled The Priestly Nation. So Isaiah 61, verses 8 through 11. And then the second outline is The Righteous Nation. And that's uh, coming from Isaiah 62, uh, verses 2 through 4a. And here in, in the, the prophet Isaiah, uh, we know that there are 66 chapters in Isaiah. And we know that, that uh, chapter 1 through 39 is about ju uh, judgment. And then chapters 40 through 66 uh, is about comfort. And in, in this, the prophecy that uh, Isaiah penned in, our, in today's lesson, we're going to see uh, the, the prophecy of Isaiah through the, the fall of the northern kingdom, Israel, uh, how the Assyrians uh, captured them. And, and then uh, years later, how the, the southern kingdom, Judah, was uh, captured by the Babylonians. He prophesied those events. And then uh, the prophecy of Israel coming out of the Babylonian captivity down through the years, how he prophesied the, the birth and ministry of Jesus Christ. And in the eighth chapter, when the eighth chapter begins, it begins with Jesus, uh, with the, the prophecy of Jesus when Jesus uh after his incarnation, he stood in the synagogue, and, and I'm, I'm going to read the, what Jesus said uh, here in um, Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 18 and 19. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then the word of God said he closed the book 
and he, he sat down and he said to those who were listening, he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ear. And he was referring, and now when, we, when you begin reading in Isaiah the 8th chapter, you read these very same words. Isaiah had prophesied. And what Jesus was saying is the prophecy up until this point uh, of Isaiah, where he, he had predicted, uh, prophesied that, that Jesus would come in his ministry. And when Jesus closed, he didn't, he, he didn't finish reading the entire uh, second verse because the prophecy was fulfilled up until that point. Now, we are, we are in uh, the last portion of that prophecy is about the second coming of Jesus, the millennium, and then eternity. And so, uh, so, so we, we're going to go back and see. And why, why is it so important that we notice how these things that God had prophesied through, through the prophets had come to pass, had come to pass exactly how, when, and where God had said they would. It's important for us to, to realize and know this because we know that if past prophecy has come to pass exactly like God had uh, said it would, then we know that those things that's in, the, in future prophecy will also come to pass the, the, exactly like God s said they would. And this, this strengthens our faith and, and really, really undergirds our hope. Because we know that if those things, uh, those past prophecies has come to pass, then those future prophecies will come to pass. But in our lesson, our lesson picks up here. We, we're going to talk about actually the, the old covenant and the new covenant. And we're going to, uh, beginning here in, in a verse, verse 8. Uh, we, we're just going to start, and here we're talking about the priests of the nation, and that refers to God's chosen people, Israel. And we're going to first look at the attitude and, and their attitudes and their actions. And here in verse, the first portion of, of verse 8, it says, For I, the Lord, love judgment. And here, here in this, this context, this, the word judgment is referring to uh, justice. Okay, so in our topic is, is uh, a God, we're talking about a, a God loving justice. And he, here, uh, when he talks about justice, he's talking about setting things right that, that's wrong. And uh, the, the word judgment here, justice, refers to uh, moral behavior. And he says, I hate robbery or burnt offering. Okay, and so what, what this refers to here is the fact that after uh, God had brought the children of Israel uh, out of bondage and allowed them to go back into to their homeland, and, and they were, you know, we know that they were under, under the law, the old covenant. And so he says he hate, here what he talks about, he, uh, I hate robbery and burnt offering. And what, what the uh, Israelites had, had come to do at this point was they were, they were carrying out the rituals of worship. And they were, they were doing sacrifices, and, and, but we find here at this point that they were just going through through the motion, uh, but their heart was not in what they were doing. And th they sacrificed, they sacrificed a, a burnt offerings were made in worship, but their lifestyle represented something else. And so God, and, and God say, said that, he said, I will direct their work in truth. And so God is going to change 
uh, change the, uh, the covenant because he's going to usher in a new covenant. And by doing that, then God would be able to, to direct their path in truth. Okay, so here, here in uh, the latter part of verse 8, it says, And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And this, this is referring to, to the new covenant. Uh, okay, so the old covenant was the sacrifice of animals. The sacrif the sac Israel would come together each year and sacrifice animals, and the blood of the animal would be carried to uh, in the holies of holies, and only the high priest could do that. Sprinkle it on the mercy seat, and this was to cover the sins of the nation. But they had to do it every year. But the new covenant here that God is. Uh, going to institute is he, he's going to allow his son Jesus Christ to who, who came and lived a sinless life and he's going to give his blood uh, sacrifice his life to pay our sin debt okay so now now we know we know back in, in the garden of Eden when Adam and Eve allowed sin uh, to come into this world then uh, every, every man that was born of a woman was born into sin and this, this new covenant that God is going to institute is going to pave the way for a man to be forgiven of his sin. Now the sacrifices of animals that would cover the sins but we're going to see a, a change here when when the new covenant is ushered in, then the blood of Jesus Christ will forgive. We can be forgiven of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Under the old covenant, the old covenant was was strictly for the Jews, but the new covenant will be for the Jews and the Gentiles alike. We we can shout about that. Okay, and so here here the salvation brought about by the one-time sacrifice of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And it would usher in the new covenant. Okay, now, now we're going to move on here in this uh, look at verse 9. We're going to see results and reactions to the new covenant. Now, uh, in, in uh, the prophecy of Isaiah, the uh, Last uh, books, books 40 through 66, uh, it's written in uh, a portrait like, a poetic like form. And in, in, that, in this writing, we're going to find what is known as uh, parallelism. And what that is, you know, parallel is sad, means side by side. And so we're going to see a statement. Uh, a parallelism is a statement or words uh, and one after another that's either contradict the first statement or word will contradict or reinforce the second word or statement. Well, let's just look at verse 9 and we'll, we'll see what we're talking about here. Okay, in verse 9 it says, And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offsprings among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. Okay, so let's look at the parallel here. Okay, it says, and their seed. Here, uh, the word seed in the first uh, portion of, of this verse is undergirded or uh, reinforced by the word offspring. And then it says, the seed or offspring shall be known among the Gentiles. And in the second portion, it says, the offspring should be known among the people. So, so the parallel here, the word is seed and offspring and Gentile and people. But, and so what, what, it, what it's really doing is, is 
uh, seeing the same thing twice. And you know, when, whenever you see the same thing said twice in the word of God, it means that we should really take note of it. Okay, so, so what it's saying is that the seed uh, uh, among the Gentiles and the offspring among the people, all that see them, talking about Israel, Israel, shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. Now we know that, that God had called Israel out and to, to be a, an example for him. And uh, they had really become a reproach to the other nations because of their, their actions toward God. And now God is saying he, this, the new covenant is going to change all that. Okay. Then it goes on here. It, it talks in, talk in verse 10. It says, I will. Uh, this is. Okay. We, we see here in verse 9. We see the results of the new covenant. How Israel will be changed from a reproach to, to uh, being acknowledged by the, by the other nations. Okay, so this also applies now. Now, this, the new covenant, remember we said that not only did it apply to, to Israel, to the Jewish nation, but also to the Gentiles also. So what it represents to us is that when we accept God's uh, son, Jesus Christ, and we are ushered into his family, we are part of the new covenant. Okay? And so... so when we come out of the world, then we're going to be uh, changed like Israel was changed because of their reproach to God. And, the, and he, that was, this is the result of the new covenant. And the reactions here in verse 10 of the Israelites, it says, I will uh, greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Again, this is a this is a, a parallelism. It, when it says "I," "I" is parallel with the word "my," my, uh, and it says "greatly rejoice." Parallels will shall be joyful, and the Lord parallels with God. And so, Israel here is gonna gonna uh, rejoice greatly because of the change that the new covenant has brought about. And when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we, under, we come out of the world the, the way Israel came out of Babylon. And a lot of times when you're reading the word of God, the word Babylon represents the world. And so when we come out of the world, we should rejoice uh, the same as Israel is rejoicing uh, by coming out of, out of captivity. Okay? And this is... is uh, their reaction to the change that God had made. So, so what, what is your reaction? When, when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you became a part of the new covenant. What was your reaction? Okay, let's go on. Uh, finish verse 10. It says, For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. Another, another parallel here. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Okay, here we see clothed and salvation clothed that means that means that we are we are uh, have been saved by the blood of Jesus okay uh, he, uh, he, uh, clothed and covered I'm sorry it's, it's what is parallel and then uh, garment and robe is parallel so here he says he has clothed me uh, with the garment of salvation he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Now, uh, if we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity, then how can we stand before God being righteous? We can do that because, because when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then righteousness is imputed to us. It is righteous, it, we didn't earn it or we don't deserve it. But God gives it to us because of our faith and the blood of Christ. It's imputed to us. And so, uh, so now we can stand before God because he sees us 
through the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees us as righteous. Okay? And so, so God's righteousness have been imputed because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Okay, and then to go verse, the uh, latter part of this verse 10 shows the beauty of the change. It says, as a bridegroom decades uh, himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorn herself with her jewels. And you know, uh, uh, the bridegroom in the New Testament is Christ, and, and the, the bride is, is uh, the church. But he is talking about the, the beauty of, of Israel and those who have come out of the world and accepted Jesus. So they look like a bride and a bridegroom that's getting ready to marry. Now, when you, when you go to a wedding and see the bride and the bridegroom, uh, they, they really look, they are really beautiful. And I, I've never seen an a ugly bride and bridegroom. I, I've seen some that just barely made it. But all brides and all grooms are beautiful. And that's what this verse represents, the beauty of being covered uh, and, uh, with the garment of salvation. And then uh, in verse 11 it says, For as the earth brings forth her buds, and as the gardener uh, causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praises to spring forth before all the nations. And, and this is this is the how how God uh, how our reaction to the new covenant. Israel, who had come out of bondage, those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ, have come out of the world, and and we're going to be uh, and our righteousness is going to spring forth. And all, all nations, all people will take note of that. Okay, so, so we looked at the first portion of our lesson. We looked at the priestly nation. Now we want to look at the righteous nation. And here it says uh, in, in chapter 62, verse, uh, we're going to start out here by looking at verse 2. It says, and the Gentiles shall see their righteousness and all kings their glory. And again, this is, this is uh, uh, those who had looked down on Israel taking note uh, here because of their change. Again, we see the parallel. It said the Gentiles is parallel with kings and then righteousness with glory. And the, the people of Israel would live lives uh, that they're so distinctive from the way they lived before the new covenant. And those of us who have come out of the world and accepted Christ, uh, our lives will be changed uh, as well. And it says, And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name them. And we know that from Scripture, when, when God changes a name, then that means that that person's character has changed, like, like it was with Jacob. And like it was with Paul, uh, uh, like it was with, with Peter when God changed their name. And this has reference to the resurrection, the second coming of Christ. And then, then it goes on to say, talks about the, the old discarded. And it says, thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hands of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hands of thy God. Again, we see a parallel here. Uh, in verse 3, uh, we see crown. It says, Thou shalt also be a crown. Uh, and then it says, A royal diadem. And the, the crown and the diadem are parallel. And then it uh, says, We shall also be, uh, be a crown of glory in the hands of the Lord. Okay, and then the other parallel is, in the hands of the Lord and in the hands of God. When we are in God's hands, then we are, uh, God has control over us. God is our, our Savior, he, and uh, He's our Lord. And when someone is Lord over you, they have control over you. And so that means that, that we, uh, God controls our actions, uh, it goes, it goes on to talk about the diadem is actually a crown, a, re, a reward for, 
uh, we, we stand in line for a reward when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, and it's a, a, a crown of glory that, that uh, God is going to give us. Thou shalt no more be termed uh, t uh, thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thou land any more be termed desolate. Another parallel here, we see uh, forsaken a parallel with desolation. And, and what this has reference to is what, when Israel was in captivity at Babylon, then, uh, it, they felt like God had abandoned them. But God, God has promised never to leave or forsake us. And, and we know that, that their, their land, uh, the temple had been destroyed, and the land lay in ruin. But when you go back and look at uh, the, we, uh, when you go back and look in Isaiah uh, 61 verses, uh, three, it says it talks it, it, and it's talking about how God made the change for Israel when He brought them out of captivity. Uh, it, it says He will appoint them to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise. For the spirit of heaviness. That, and so, so God is going to change the, uh, the way that other nations look at them. Because they, they, uh, they, think they feel forsaken and their land is desolate. But this is, the, this is the restoration that God brings to Israel after their captivity. And this is the restoration God brings to us when we come out of the world and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And he, he does all this because, and the verse goes on to say, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And so, so God is going to put us in a position where we can give him praise and glory because of the new covenant that he has brought about. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, uh, for plainly opening up to us and allowing us to, to look into to your heart and to your mind. And we just want to be obedient to you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who willingly gave his life that we might enjoy the things that we enjoy. We love you. We praise you. We magnify you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks and praises always. Well, again, friends, we thank you for joining us on today. And we look forward to having you in our next session. So until then, may God richly bless and keep you is our prayer.